So, uh, I thought today we would, we would kind of take a little bit of a departure. We're going to talk about a few different Jewish personalities today. But in light of what's been going on in the world, I thought we'd do a little overview of the history of the Jewish community in France, of the Jews in France, and highlight some of the more, not that everyone isn't important, but more of the more important figures of Jewish-French history, and then kind of circle it back to the events of the day. And uh, we're getting handouts, they'll be here soon. But the history of the Jews in France is a long one just like most of uh, Eastern European Jewry. After the Romans uh, destroyed uh, uh, Judea and Samaria, is ancient Israel, and exiled all the Jews, the Jews were scattered all around the world. And as we know, they went to different places. The Jews in France mostly came uh, in the very in early days, in the first century and such, from Italy, from Rome. And, it, and made their way to France from Italy and Rome and some from Spain. And uh, just like most other places in the world, once the uh, Christian world became firmly rooted in Europe, the Jews in France suffered persecutions just like everywhere else in, in Europe uh, at, 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 the, at the time. So there were small French Jewish communities, most interestingly, not, uh, not necessarily in Paris, in some smaller cities around uh, France. And um, they thrived to a degree, then they were kicked out, and then they would come, they would be allowed back, and they would thrive. And um, throughout history, uh, the Jews in France were um, allowed to remain there at the at the grace, good graces of whatever royal family was in control at the time. So it actually became a, there, a system developed in France where the Jews in France were considered for the no, nobility, French nobility, the same as their serfs except the Jews filled more uh, middle management type positions as traditional all around Europe, collecting the rents for the lords of the manor, uh, keeping the treasury, mm -hmm. keeping the books, um, and those sorts of import export work, those sorts of trades that Christians could not engage in because Christianity prohibits money lending and dealing with money in those kinds of ways. So they flourished economically on one level, but on another level, as serfs, they were actually considered the purview, the property of the lord of the manor. And so it, you served at the, um, you lived at the, in the good graces of whoever the lord of the manor was, and if the Lord of the Manor decided, I'm going to sell off this piece of my land, and you happen to live there. Well, it was up to the new Lord of the Manor whether or not you stayed. And ultimately, all of your possessions were considered the Lord, the Lord of the Manor's possessions. So he could, he could, without impunity, take your house, your furniture, your jewelry, whatever you had was considered really his because you were a property. Uh, of, and you were there at the pleasure of the nobility. So that went on for a long time. And then, of course, anti-Semitism rears its, its ugly head. The Jews are kicked out. There's riots against Jews. Jews are murdered, kicked out of the country. They went to places nearby where they could get to, you know, nearby, Poland, many, or, you know, uh, that area would come back, eventually would be allowed to come back. And at one point, um, they were invited back uh, after uh, the reign of Charlemagne um, because uh, they were viewed as uh, the economic class, if you, if you will. They, Jews were reviled. They had to live separately, just like in Jewish history throughout most of Europe. However, the Jews were the class that was the economic class that managed the money lending, the banking, the import-export businesses, the rent collections, the tax, the tax uh, 
collections and things like that. And on top of it, of course, the Jews themselves were heavily taxed. Okay? So there's, throughout all of this time, there was one rabbi who rose to prominence in French Jewry. Does anybody know who he was? Rashi, yes. So Rashi, um, and you have a little, uh, a little biography of him. I'm handing out right now. Rashi was in the second half of the 11th century, like 1040. He lived in Troyes. His real name was Rabbi Shlomo Yitzchaki. And he was considered one of the, and is still considered one of the great geniuses of Jewish thought. And if you look at a page of Talmud, there's always Rashi's commentary. It's in a, it's in a uh, slightly different script of handwriting, so it's very easily distinguishable. But what Rashi was famous for was really giving clear explanations of the text. So if you know um, Talmud, you see a page of Talmud, you know that it's all around it. It's all different like, writings. Does everybody know what I'm talking about? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. Okay. You look at a page of Talmud, and the very top, there's one piece of text that comes right from the Torah. Then all around it are other writings from different rabbis, all circling around it, that are their commentaries and interpretations on that particular piece of text. Rashi's is usually found along the bottom somewhere, sometimes on the side. And he was known for really clarifying the ideas of the day, whereas sometimes the other rabbi's writing might be, you know, people would have a harder time understanding what was meant. Rashi really was known to clear, to clarify everything up. In addition to being a rabbi and having one of the greatest yeshivas of the time, he also was known to be a winemaker. And he made wine for the Jewish community, which was, had to be kosher and used in, you know, used it for sacramental purposes. But he, his wine was known as very good wine. And I think that there's an Israeli label today, actually, a winery that's called Rashi. Do you have any um, more papers? They never no, make me no, enough. The last one. All right, we'll ask them to make some more. Uh, please share if you, if, you, if you don't have one. So the other thing about Rashi in his yeshiva was very renowned. The other thing that he's known for is that he believed in educating his daughters. And there's some novels that uh, Maggie Anton wrote to Rashi's daughters, which are based on truth, though, that Rashi did educate his daughters. They, they were in themselves very uh, well-regarded uh, scholars, <laughs> female scholars. So from Rashi, we go back to long, you know, more persecution from the 10th century on, in and out of France, as I described before, until we come to the time of the emancipation, the enlightenment. What happened at that time? This is, we're talking late 1700s, early 1800s. I talked about the, the, this a lot in my class. The Industrial Revolution? Em emancipation, the Industrial Revolution was a big part of it. Mm. The printing press? Yep, mm. the printing press. And ideals that, were, that came out of first the American Revolution, which formed a country here, in, in North America based on individual liberties and freedoms, and then the French Revolution, right? So those, the idea of emancipation, the, the core idea of it, late 1700s, emancipation or enlightenment was that all human beings, they really meant men in those days because women were, but people were entitled to an education were entitled to a, a life of uh, liberty and the pursuit of happiness, ideas that had been first developed here in, in uh, America by the Founding Fathers, which then carried over, which resonated in France, and which then caused the, put the wheels in motion for the French Revolution. But those were times when people were breaking out of the traditional European yoke of monarchies and nobility and serfdoms and, um, and this very huge division of the classes 
to create a more equitable society all around based on, on ideals of more equitable society, which then translated to more equitable opportunities for Jews as well. And Napoleon actually wound up to be, I, I never knew this until I was researching this for today, Napoleon was turned out to be, he was pretty much a great friend of the Jews. Mm -hmm. And while Napoleon was emperor of France, he put into motion legislation in France that made Judaism an equal religion with the other religions of France. Huge step. Because in France before that there was majority Catholicism, then there were some Protestant and uh, most notably Lutheran types of Protestantism. And prior to that, Judaism was not, did not have any rights or considerations as a religion in France, and Jews were considered second-class citizens. But Napoleon put this idea into law that Judaism was one of France's religions, an official religion of France. And as such, the French state, and to this day, gives an allocation to uh, clergy, regardless of their faith, to help support their churches. And uh, as such, then, Rabbis and synagogues began to also receive government funding to operate in France. This is huge. This was not even happening here in America. In uh, America, there was no sanctioned state religion. You know, we're, we're, uh, we're not about religion. And, That's um, the Bonaparte. Napoleon Bonaparte. Well, when I was in France, I, years ago, I, they had the tomb there in the museum there. Yeah. So he made Judaism one of France's official religions, and he recognized that the Jews had been, had been, he called them a nation within a nation, and living as a nation within a nation in his mind, largely because of anti-Semitic separatist policy. And so to that end, he did two things. One, he established what he called the Grand Sanhedrin, which was a convening of all the top rabbis in France, who, who would be responsible for making any religious kinds of decisions and also for liaising <coughs> with the French government. They were, part, they were actually part of the French, a department part of the French government. And, uh, and uh, what did I say? I said one, he did that, and two, he lifted uh, traditional bans on where Jews could live because prior to that, there had been restrictions about where Jews could live. You couldn't live in this part of town, you couldn't live there, you had to live here. He insisted on, li on lifting those. So his goal was to integrate French society and as a whole, and the Jewish presence, the Jewish community in France was a part of that. And the new French Republic was founded on principles of religious equality and liberty for all. And in fact, the current uh, Prime Minister of France, which, what's his name? Hollande. What just said uh, a few months ago, in, in light of all the anti-Semitic attacks that have been going on, he said, if, if Jews leave France as a result of all of this anti-Semitic activity, we will have failed as a republic. Because part of Napoleon's main idea was that France should be a place where all people could live in liberty and, uh, and it would be a bastion of freedom. That was the French, the French idea. So, but did that really happen? No. no. Okay, we know that. So, and we're gonna get to what's going on, but before we do, I wanna talk about another product of the emancip emancipation and the enlightenment, and that's the Rothschilds. So, I say the name Rothschild, everybody goes, okay, rich, you know, rich Jewish family, bankers. So the Rothschilds are fascinating, and I, I would encourage you to read about them. Their history is really interesting. They are a, a banking family. Even to this day, their holdings are very well secured within their family structure. The earliest Rothschilds, and again, you have a little piece of autobiography here. 
left France. He started out working in France in banking, and his name was Mayer Rothschild. And he left. He left uh, Germany. He was in Frankfurt, and he left Germany and went to France. And then he established all of his sons in different cities around Europe. He had five sons, and one was in Paris, one was in Frankfurt, one was in London, one was in Vienna, and Antwerp. I think those were the places. Since we're making, they had a picture, a story of that on the TV. It was very, very interesting. It's very interesting. It had been about two hours. And it was, they made it in a fictional way, but of course we knew that it was not fiction. So they, they spread out their banking interests all around Europe. They, were, they had their fingers in a lot of different pies. They financed, interestingly, they, in the, the French branch was financing Napoleon. The London branch was financing the British uh, government against Napoleon. But they, they, so they worked independently, but at the same time, amongst themselves, they stayed very connected, and they were very strategic, and they really built an empire of uh, a banking empire all around Europe. They, they helped to manage the treasuries of the countries where they were in. They bankrolled the war chests of the countries where they were in. And to, because of this, many people started to hate them. <laughs> that the Rothschilds control the world, they have all the money in the world, and to this day, people, if you Google them, you will find conspiracy theorists who say, oh, the Rothschilds are really the uh, Illuminati, they're the devils, you know, they're satanic, they're, they're the Jews who control the world, it's all, the, they, the Rothschilds have everybody like puppets on a string, but they really, without them, that whole period of industrial revolution, of exploration, of broadening, uh, of broadening influence around the world, the colonialization of the world in the 1800s, which Britain was engaged in colonialism, France was engaged in colonialism, uh, Turkey, all of those, all of those governments were relying upon Rothschild money. And, uh, and, and Rothschild uh, influence and help in building up contemporary modern Europe, bringing Europe out of the Middle Ages really into a contemporary economy. So they had a policy of marrying within the family. They married cousins so that they kept everything in Rothschild hands. In modern times, that has gone by the wayside, they marry out of their family now, but in the, in, for the first hundred years or so, they were very strictly, you mar you married, they married each other, their cousins all married each other. And they were dead, they were too, right? Some of them did, but not, but mostly, not until after they, they what broke the this idea of marrying yeah. cousins. Well, they married second and third cousins, and you know, they married. They, they kept they kept their wealth in their family, and even to this day, they're said to have keep very close-minded about what their holdings actually are. Were they known to to do anything for the betterment of the African? Well, I'm going to I'm going to get there. Before I do, though, in addition to the the banking and the and and and. Uh, equity holdings, they also got into precious metal and gems, and the Rothschilds owned De Beers diamonds in South Africa. And just like everybody in those days, you know, now there's, there's, there's some controversy about what they call blood diamonds and, mm -hmm. and African labor and extracting diamonds from the mines. Um, remember in the, early, in, in the early days of the Rothschild Empire, slavery was still uh, common in the world. They had, they had, they had slave trading you know, interests and ships. So there weren't 
a paragon of virtue. They were, they were, a, an, they were about building an economy. And yes, they did do a lot for the betterment of the world. Firstly, they put a lot into Jewish causes, and they put a lot into the Palestine. Yeah. They put a lot of money into founding early, the early Zionist settlements of the first Aliyah. They, built, they put in farms and vineyards, and they, they put a lot of money into supporting the Jews of Palestine and growing Palestine. I just want to ask a question. When I was in Israel, they said that one of the Rothschilds was in Israel, and he said he wanted Hebrew to be the language of Israel, and that's how it developed, that they would only speak Hebrew. I, that's when I went into a museum. That could very well be yeah. that he had, you know, the Hebrew know developed as the language of Israel for a lot of different reasons, but I wouldn't be surprised to know that there was Rothschild influence about that. And because, you know, the person who's holding the purse strings has a lot of say in what happens, right? <laughs> so they held a lot of purse strings in the development of the early state of Israel. And even today they give to, there's hospitals named for them they give in Israel. They didn't only give it to, to Jewish and Israeli causes, though. They also gave all around Europe, uh, in the in the world, to to hospitals, medical research, um, schools, and education, and and many other philanthropic endeavors. They, for all their money, they're also known for being extremely philanthropic. Well, the father felt that there was so much anti-Semitism that he wanted his children. To, to grow up and, and have pr uh, professions, and, and that you know stimulated the kids to study when they were younger, to do these things when right. they grew up. He felt that the, the job situation and discrimination was so terrible. That is true, and he also felt that if, that, that is true, that, that Mayor Rothschild, when he first sent his sons out, part of his motivation was A, to build an empire, and two, to build that economic empire so that his hope was that by working with the governments and being an important asset and ally to the governments of the countries that, that they were, uh, that they had established banks in, that it would help to alleviate anti-Semitism and create more respect for Jews around the world. That is definitely one of his motivations. So, there's a little town up north, or actually 30 uh, miles south of Haifa, called Zichron Yaakov. My daughter's moved there, so I know all about that. There, they built that town. Right. Mm -hmm. They they have a buried I think one of the Rothschilds I think is buried in this beautiful garden area, acres and acres of gardens there. They have the synagogue is named after the father. Um, and they're still used today. Um, but the they took the wine the wine the, the, the wine but, but one the of the winery things winery there's a museum winery. that said that when the Romanian um, uh, people made originally came over, they were very unsuccessful trying to farm the land. So the Rothschilds uh, sent over their overseers and said the way to farm this land and be successful is you have to follow our rules. We have to, we have to have sort of a collective uh, uh, approach. And the the farmers weren't very happy because it sort of took over their autonomy. You know, they took over the. But uh, without but them, it the wouldn't. First strings. Yeah, yeah, they hold they the first strings. Yeah, they hold the first But without them, but the museum would really. Uh, said that while they built it, there were also a lot of criticism of how they did it. They did it. Yeah, well, they were very autocratic. Yes. They had the money, and they and they said, "Listen, we're the we're the funders. We get to say." But they brought it. They, they the way Rothschilds learned about agriculture, and this, this is backing up some addition with the minerals and diamonds. Is they also got into viticulture, and to this day, their labels, their French labels, are Chateau Lafitte, and um, and I don't remember the name of the other one, but there's another one that are venerable French wineries. Um, and they're really, you know, they, they brought that viticulture expertise over to Zico and Yaakov. That was one of the, the main crops, was trying to make wine in Israel, which really, until modern times, has been terrible wine. But now it's, it's getting good now. So, but that's the way, that's the way vineyards are, actually. They can take many, many, they can take 100 years to develop and really get good. So. They're a really interesting family who has influenced, really has influenced world economy on a very grand scale. So it's not surprising the conspiracy theories that are out there about them. Um, some pretty far out there stuff about how, you know, the satanic rituals and that's how they got rich. And it's crazy. It's it's probably, they've been, they've been, they've been, um, 
uh, uh, they've been named like one of the most enigmatic, mysterious families of the world because they are very closed about what exactly their holdings are and how they work it. And they're still around today. They still have a huge banking uh, conglomerate today. <coughs> so, interesting, the Rothschilds. Um, Another French Jew that I wanted to talk about that was influ very influential in French society um, was a woman by the name of Sarah Bernhardt. Aww. So total tra change around from the very wealthy from the very wealthy Rothschilds to Sarah Bernhardt. She was born to a Jewish mother. Her mother was a, was a courtesan, a very high level courtesan, and she does not, there's no record of who her father is. She was, her mother did have a patron who was a duke of somebody or other, who, uh, who, who did insist upon Sarah being baptized, and at age 13 she was baptized, and she was sent to a convent to school. But, According to records in her own mind, she considered herself a, a Jew. And I gave you a quote that she wrote at the end. She had received some theatrical criticism about how her work was wandering and all over the place. And she said, well, I'm a Jew. What do you expect? We wander and go all over the place. It's, I, you have the quote exactly over there. So although she wasn't a religious person, and she certainly led a colorful life of the theater with many paramours that she never married. She did have a son, one son named Marcel. Um, she, I would, you would arguably say, when you say the name Sarah Bernhardt, almost everyone um, recognizes that name as being a, a pioneer of theater, of contemporary theater. And what was interesting about her also is that she was a very plucky woman, and she made her own money, she made her own way in the world, Starting at 16, she started to actually ran away from the convent and went into acting. So why and she, did she go into uh, uh, to the convent? Her mother sent her. You know, her mother and her mother's patron. That was for her education. And her mother was a courtesan. It's hard to have a teenage girl around when you're. You know, we're talking the late 1800s. So um, she traveled the world with her touring company, and she she established her own theater company. Traveled the world touring with it, and she bought a, her own theater in France. And it's to this day, it's called the Theater Sarah Bernhardt, and it and productions are staged there. So she made her own way, and she, and she was a huge influence on culture. The French were very proud of her. She was considered one of the premier actresses of the day, and she was a Jewess. So coming from a time, this weird time where Napoleon had just emancipated, and there was this whole idea that 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 uh, Jews were as free as anybody else, uh, any other Frenchman. Um, she, you know, and at the same time, there's all this anti-Semitism going on, because there still was always anti-Semitism, it never really stopped. She made her way as a, as a doyen of the theater in, in Paris and around the world. I thought it'd be interesting just to throw her in for a yeah. minute. Yeah. And then along keeping with the arts is Marc Chagall. Now, you could say Marc Chagall was not French because he really was born and raised in Russia. Mm -hmm. However, as a young man, he went to France to study art and was very influenced by the Impressionists there and was taken under wing by many of the Impressionists, including Pissarro, who was, who was Jewish. And um, he was, from the get-go, so alarmingly different of an artist. And where else could he have uh, prospered and become successful than in France, which was looking for the avant-garde at that time. They were looking, you know, Impressionism was a whole new thing, and they were looking for something different, out there, way out, you know. Um, and Chagall just fit the bill. Uh, and eventually, he had a long history in, he, in France. He left France. He was able to get out and, uh, before World War II and escape the Nazis. He came here uh, during that time, and then he returned to France, and he lived out the rest of his life in France. Um, 
And he was selected for a very important commission in Paris. Does anyone know what it is? The sealing, the the sealing of the Opera House. Has anybody been in Paris at the French Opera? Chagall painted that ceiling, which is an amazing ceiling. And the colors and, and the themes that he used, he took from, from the uh, emotions evoked by different composers and different operas. And it's kind of this surrealistic, you know, Chagallist ceiling. So when the rest of the opera house, when you go like into the main hallway, it's all that gold gilt, you know, Louis the Fourteenth, very traditional French, lots of gold and lots of mirrors. And then you go into the opera house, and it's in reds, but that ceiling is almost, a long, you know, shocking. It's so different from what you expect. And when they unveiled that, first of all, when they gave him the commission, there was a lot of criticism amongst the public to give a Jew the commission of the Paris Opera House was considered, you know, many people thought that was inappropriate. But on the opening night, when they unveiled that ceiling, it said that, that France plots, basically. <laughs> 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 that they loved it. And it was, and it is gorgeous and an amazing, amazing thing. So Chagall was, very influenced by French culture, even though he was born and raised in Russia, he adopted France really as his, as his, uh, as his home, and except for brief times when he left during the war and such, he considered himself an adopted Frenchman. Although some people didn't consider him a Frenchman because he was a Jew and he came from Russia, but you know he did the uh, stained glass at Hadassah, yeah. and um, quite a renowned artist. So th those are kind of the highlights of French Jewelry in France. Any questions or comments about Chagall, Sarah Bernhardt? Or? He did the lobby in Lincoln Center. Yeah. What is that? The, the mural. Oh, the Metropolitan Lobby. Yeah, it's at Lincoln Center. Did he do that here? Or Yes, he came to New York, he worked here. And his work, it's not like you know Michelangelo who painted on the ceiling. He painted on canvases, which were then mounted. That's it's canvases that are mounted on the ceiling. But they're huge canvases. <coughs> he lived in upstate New York for the years that he was in America. Oh. And it's called High Falls because I was in the country and there was an exhibit in this little town. And why did he choose that little town? because a lot of the people there spoke Yiddish. And he was very comfortable with Yiddish from Russia. Oh, and he went up sorry, there, sorry. and uh, there's a house that he rented, and he lived there, and his, he adored his wife. She died very early, and she's found in almost all his paintings. Yes, yeah. he, he did. And then he did marry again. He did adore his wife. He had a, he had a, a, a girlfriend after she died. It did not work out for too long. And then his daughter set him up. Um, with uh, with someone because she was worried her father was lonesome, and, but the marriage only lasted six months, and she got away. The woman's name was Vava, and she got away with a lot of his money for a six-month marriage. She ended up making out like a bandit. <laughs> you know, I debated talking about Dreyfus, so it is worth probably throwing in a little bit about Dreyfus. What do we know about Dreyfus? Do you want to say? Um, he was in the French army. He was falsely accused of something, but basically just because he was Jewish. He was in Okay, and his, I think he spent many, many years in the prison where his wife somehow after persevering and fighting, I think she, didn't she, oh, Emile Zola, yes. So he got him out. Yes, it, it was, it wasn't, it was, it was uh, under 10 years that he was in prison, but yes, he did eventually get out. And Dreyfus was an example, actually, of Napoleon's Emancipation Proclamation uh, laws, because that also opened up the army, the volunteer Jews. army, which was the French army, which after the Napoleonic Wars was a volunteer army for Jews. And, Jew and many Jews felt it was their patriotic and civic responsibility to join the army 
or take up positions of government which had been uh, in the past barred to them because they were Jews. And this created, I'm diverging off of Dreyfus a little bit, but it reminded me of something that I just saw recently. I was at the Jewish Museum in uh, the Upper East Side last week with some of my students. And there's a painting there um, that is of a Jewish family in France. It's obviously during Shabbat because there's a challah on the table and light is coming in from the window. And it's called The Volunteer, and it depicts a young man who just came home from being in the army who's received a Medal of Honor. And the Medal of Honor is what? From Napoleon. Cross. It's a cross. cross. Yeah. So he's comes <clears throat> home to his house, a Jewish home. His parents, is, uh, it's, it's Shabbat. So obviously, one, he desecrates the Shabbat by coming, you know, traveling and coming home on the Shabbat. Two, his father, who's so happy to see him and has his arm around him but can't take his eyes off his cross <laughs> in, the, in the painting that's on his son's chest. So that's an illustration of what was going on in France in the time, that the world all of a sudden opened up to the Jews. That, that young man's father would never have thought of joining the French army. He wouldn't have been allowed to join the French army or hold a position in government. So Dreyfus was one of those who thought it was his patriotic responsibility, both as a Frenchman and as a Jew, to serve in the army. And he was set up for a, 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 an act of espionage. It, it later was revealed that he was set up. I think the Dreyfus affair is very important because I think that was one of the impetus for Herzl. Well, it yeah. was. Right. Yeah. To, uh, to uh, you know, to establish, you know, to bring the count people together to establish yeah, a homeland in Israel because that's right. of that. That's right. So Dreyfus, it, Dreyfus it, later on, it was light was shed on it. It came to light that Dreyfus actually was a patsy. He was set up. He was a fall guy for someone else's treason and espionage um, uh, of sending secrets to the Germans. Um, and uh, it's at his trial where Theodore Herzl was a, a reporter covering the trial. And the anti-Semitism was so virulent and hateful. And throughout the trial, people were, you know, shouting, you know, murder, kill the Jew, you know, that Herzl in his heart, and Herzl himself had been a secular Jew living in emancipated uh, Switzerland, you know, was so struck by the level of vitriol that he realized that even with emancipation and enlightenment, there really, the anti-Semitism was always going to be uh, a presence, and there had to be the establishment of a Jewish state. And that got Herzl thinking about it. So Dreyfus is, Dreyfus's contributions as a French Jew were kind of, uh, you know, as a French Jew, he served in the army. It, what, if, if that hadn't happened, chances are he would not be a remarkable <coughs> personality, but because his trial inspired the uh, advancement of the Zionist idea, he is an important person also. So that's kind of the Zionist idea came out of the Dreyfus trials and French Jewry, which leads us to today. What horrible things happened last year. <coughs> I mean, it was really, really, a horrible thing, and um, I, I gave you a handout, in your handout, you have this article, The Frightening Reality for the Jews of France. Yes. Tablet is an online Jewish magazine. I really recommend it if, if you uh, are not familiar with it. It's an excellent uh, online publication. And I really, there's all kinds of points of view and uh, the writing is, is excellent. So this, this article, which was just written uh, last week, is kind of an outline of all the, the ride, you know, an outline of all the, the, uh, the um, events, anti-Semitic events that, that happened in France in the past <laughs> year. So starting with January 26th of 2013. So she calls it a frightening reality, and it is a frightening reality, 
And part of it started out with, with the popularity of something called the Quenelle, which is a, basically a, a Heil Hitler salute, which has been popularized by this French comedian named, I'm not gonna, I'm gonna butcher the pronunciation of his name, Giodon or something like that. Um, and, and ironically, it's called Giodon. And that's his name? So he is God given. He's a popular comedian, a satirist, and he's also um, horribly anti Semitic in his comedy. A lot of it has to do is macabre comedy around uh, Jews being, you know, death of the Jews and anti Semitism. So there. I'm sorry? Didn't they just put him into jail the other day? I think he was arrested recently, yeah. yes. So, before inciting, before inciting, and France right now, this week, has been trying to crack down, maybe a little late, on anti-Semitism, because like I said, Hollande said that if we allow, if Jews leave France because of anti-Semitism, we will have failed as a republic. I think that he sincerely means that, that Napoleon founded the New Republic of France based on ideas of freedom and liberty, specifically naming the Jews as a part of French society and creating a framework to allow them to be uh, live in France as equal citizens. <coughs> so if that hasn't happened in all this time since Napoleon, you know, and we can't forget that in the middle, in the middle there, since Napoleon, we did have the Holocaust, and many French people were complicit with the Nazis. There were two concentration camps located in France proper, and that that the that uh, the roundup that Jews were routinely rounded up by the Germans in France um, during the Holocaust. So we can't forget that that happened also. Remember last year, or the year before, there was a movie that came out about the all the, the French Jews yes. being rounded up and held in the stadium. So we have to remember that in the middle of in the middle of the time since Napoleon, we had World War One, we had World War Two. And now and uh, so now here we are today with people being uh, held hostage and killed. So let's just, um, yeah, here it is. Duodon Mibala Mibala. Duodon. Is that how you say it? I'm, I'm not a. Duodon. That sounds about right because there's a accent. Yeah, an accent. I did take French in high school, but that was a long time ago. It doesn't matter. It's all I All right. The accent is here. So, starting last January, um, here's anti-government protesters shouting, Jews, France is not yours. And <coughs> then, in March, a man's beaten on the Paris metro. Jews, we are going to lay into you. You have no country. Then, um, when France's Jews demand the election of a new chief rabbi, um, the letter, the, they, they, uh, they ask for the, the lead of a leader to express the voice of Judaism during the difficult period we are experiencing. An Israeli man attacked with a stun gun in the Marais, Jewish teacher attack, swastika on his chest after, after breaking his nose, fining, you know, all of these things happen. One of the more horrible, I mean, all of it's horrible, <coughs> but um, if you recall last summer, there was a synagogue that was held hostage. Let's see where that is. That's on here. Do you remember that? that yeah. Um, yeah, Bastille Day. Bastille Day. They actually surrounded the synagogue on Shabbat and wouldn't let people leave, and it was a whole thing of actual fisticuffs. So why is this happening in France? Ideas, thoughts? I think I could be offensive. Okay, one at a time. So the number of Muslims have, have, uh, has grown, and they resent what's happening in Israel, that there's some kind of equation between those two things. Maybe. I mean, both of those are thought of as. I think it still has to do with Christmas. <coughs> with what? With 
crystal knock and the Nazism still still traces of that living on? I, I maybe also. That's certainly an element too. What were you going to say? No, I was saying that it was a, a large number of Muslim <coughs> people living there. But there is also, I had an experience. My daughter was learning French in Japan. Speak louder. She had a, a young lady who was tutoring her, a French lady, a French young woman, a young woman, maybe 25 or something. My daughter was, what, 15 at the time. And then she came to our house for the first time because she was teaching her privately at the school. And when she saw a mezuzah in the door, she made a terrible face, and she left. And she said, I'm not going to teach you a mezuzah. So and this was a French young woman. So these things are going back many, many years. So did you hear what he what was said? No. That, 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 uh, that a, a young French woman was deterred from teaching his daughter French when she came to the house and saw it was a Jewish home, and that there was a mezuzah, she left and yeah. refused to teach. And she was a 25-year-old French woman, so. And made a bad uh, face, you know. Scowl. Other ideas? I'm gonna say that's gone on so many years. I remember when the restaurant was going up, the Marais section. I remember reading that day years ago, and then when I was there, that was the first thing I remember, being in that area and seeing that restaurant. And that, maybe that's been 20 years ago, or 25, or maybe. I don't remember the name of the, uh, yeah, I, I, I ate my restaurants. Yeah, right. Interestingly, my son lives in Paris. In the region. Can you speak up? Oh, am I call, being quiet? I used yeah. my voice yelling. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> and um, he was at the okay. Stand. The Marais. She took his wife for her two children. <clears throat> and a man came over and said, "I'm Jewish." To my son, he said, "Yes." Would you like me to lay tefillin with you? And Would you Robert, like tefillin, lay tefillin. What do you mean? Would you like to put tefillin? Yeah, I think it was the first time you did that. And um, so he did. And my grandchildren were fascinated by they had never seen that before. But my answer to the other question is that doesn't France have the largest population of Jews in Europe today? It does. Yes. It has the. It, there's about 500,000 Jews in France. Uh, in France, although in the recent years there has been pretty um, significant numbers of French Jews moving to Israel, an equivalency based on what the American Jewish population is to what the French Jewish population is would be that in the that in the past year, 85,000 American Jews left for left to go live in Israel. And that would be the equivalency. I want to say it's uh, it's maybe 4,000 French Jews, but based on what our population is and their population is, percentage-wise, that would be a, an, an equation. I hope we put a real estate in Israel. Not only are the French people going to Israel, they are buying up property mm -hmm. just in case mm -hmm. all the coastline yes. is being yeah. bought by French mm -hmm. jewelry. Yeah, that's true. Well, so they I rent it. Meanwhile, they are still okay, but they want that place here. Yeah. I think in general the French community, French Jewish community, is a wealthy community. Yeah. Um, and you know, still involved in business, shop owners, and and there's also that resentment. Many of the, um, well, at least I think it's a Marais. Uh, area borders right on a Muslim, you know, area. But I think that, that there's, there's always been a jealousy of. Uh, of, the, of there has always been a threat of anti-Semitism, whether it's the influx of Muslim immigration or vestiges of Nazi uh, anti-Semitism. The the Muslim population that's in France right now, you have to remember, in the colonialization period. Where did France colonize? Algeria. Algeria. North Africa, Muslim countries. And there is a policy in France, in France that colonial states have, you know, you don't need to go through uh, immigration processes. You can just come to France. So when economies get bad or more people leave Tunisia or, uh, you know, Libya, and they, they went 
back to France, or when the when Morocco uh, became, uh, in, in, you know, when the um, I want to say the Shah, but it's not the Shah. There was a changeover from a more secular government to a more religious Islamic government. People fled for France, and there's great poverty in those Muslim neighborhoods. They are the slums of of uh, of France and of Paris. There's great poverty. There's unemployment. There's a lot of disaffected young people who have had inadequate education and with inadequate opportunity. They are, they are fairly segregated. They're fairly closed society. They have not integrated and assimilated, whereas French Jewry, for a large part, has integrated and assimilated. Um, whether or not they're Orthodox or not Jews, they still as, uh, as was said, they're still very active in French society, educated, holding positions, you know, different jobs, being doctors and lawyers and teachers and bankers, whereas this Muslim population is largely disaffected. Um, they, they also said in some of these neighborhoods, the police would not even go yeah. into. It's no that dangerous yeah. Yeah. that the police are afraid to enter them. Yeah. Yeah. Law is Sharia. Yeah. yeah, it is. It's what? Their law is Sharia. Yeah. yeah. That's what they, they go by. It's no yeah. What does that mean? Yeah. They, they, they go There's also the anti-Semitism on, on, on the left. So you took right. the right, the Muslims, and the left, and the media. No, well, that's where I was going uh, next. So there's these disaffected Muslims. Yeah. Is there a Muslim backlash and threats that the press may be hiding? What do you mean a Muslim backlash? In other words, the resentment what's going on, but they're afraid to, they're covering it up, they're afraid to, uh, like. Oh no, they, when, when they recently had the, the, um, the funerals of the, of the people who were killed at the magazine Charlie Hebdo, the whole of France had a moment of silence and in the schools their classes stopped and there was asked to be a national moment of silence. It, it was put in the newspapers that in the Muslim schools they refused to abide by the moment of silence. They refused? So they would not, they, they would not acknowledge the moment of silence. So on the one hand, there's this very large Muslim population, which some people say, well, it's because of the Palestinian issue. I personally think that's a cop out. I think that's a handy, convenient excuse that's, that's made. It's because Israel won't allow the Palestinians to live. That's, I think that that's a scapegoat reason, but you know, I'm sure there are truths in that. It, that there, for some people, that resonates, and it probably does. But I think the larger issue is disaffection and poverty and <coughs> feelings of you know hopelessness that poor people you know that 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 cause and Sharia law and, and other factors. And then the other piece of it is on the other side, there's the far right with the uh, socialist, uh, the French. Uh, they call. They think they call themselves socialists, but really a fascist party headed up by Marine Le Pen. Her father was a notorious anti-Semite, a, a neo-Nazi, um, and that also comes out of feelings of, of you know being disaffected. That there's a whole uh, working class, a French person who is not prospering economically, who feels stuck, who feels that doors are closed, who, who can't you know, who, the, with, with lack of opportunity, and traditionally, mm -hmm. the scapegoat is the are the Jews. That is just the historic fact of almost the history of the entire world. So, I don't really know or have the answers, but I just thought that in light of what had, has been going on, it would make for an interesting topic today to talk about the Jewish community of France, some of the highlights of, of people and where we are today. And um, thank you all for listening. Yeah. They, um, I think it was four to fill the very Israel. Yes. Would they have been there? Yes. No. I, I also, before you leave, just to leave you with this, it was asked, but the people who had been killed in the supermarket that's buried in Israel and not been killed under these particular circumstances, I don't know. But I do know that there is now a tension that's arising between um, uh, the French government and the French Jewish establishment with this whole question of Jews leaving France to live in Israel. 
and that there's a tension around that, that, you know, an idea that some people think the Jews should stay, fight it out, fight for their rights, and make France, you know, stand up for being a French Jew. And there, there are those who are like, no way, because history does history repeats itself, we know. So one of the articles I just read, and I don't know if it's true, is a comment that they sent to Israel because I was afraid if they buried them here, someone would desecrate those graves. Now that could I don't know how valid that is. Anyway, thank you all and I'll see you in the next